Open the morning edition, a second fire hits the Ministry of Education, the Defense Force Commodore on the safety of officers at sea, and the road to recovery for another cancer survivor. It's a Friday and the weekend is here. Good morning, everyone. I'm LaDawn Davis and this is the Morning Edition. Thank you so much for waking up with us. Right now, you're looking at a live shot of the Madeira Street area from our ZNS Tower Cam, but if you are on the streets, your commute could be a bit difficult in some areas. Traffic reporter Siaska Adderley is on our streets assessing the issue. Good morning, Siaska. Good Friday morning. This morning's traffic report, we're coming to you live from Lewis Street. We're not necessarily on a busy thoroughfare this morning, but it could get hectic in a residential area as well during your morning commute. Here to tell us what to look out for, what we should and should not be doing when driving through a residential area is Corporal Amico Evans from the Traffic Division. Good Friday morning. We're at the end of another work week, aren't we, uh, Corporal Evans? Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Adley. Good morning, Bahamas. Good. And so we're here on Lewis Street, as I said. Said it's a residential area, but there are definitely things that we should and should not be doing when we're driving through a residential area, right? That's that's correct. Uh, most importantly, your speed. You must monitor your speed as you commute through residential areas for obvious reasons. Uh, a lot of kids, pedestrians, sometimes uses the very narrow pathway, as you can see. Uh, you don't want to park your vehicles in a manner to obstruct traffic as they commute uh, both north and south through Lewis, through Lewis Street and the other narrow corners. Okay, and what about music? Is there a certain level that music should be at when you're traveling through residential areas as well? Well, you want your music uh, moderate, uh, moderate so you can hear. Uh, we have we receive a lot of calls uh, about loud music, which uh, some, sometimes disturb the peace through residential areas. Okay, now you're talking about it being narrow and it being a residential area. What is actually the speed limit through areas like this? Well, you want to, the speed limit for sure through residential areas such as this should be about 20 miles per hour. All right, thank you so much. That's Corporal Miko Evans telling you what you should and should not do when traveling through a residential area because we all know, Bahamians, that sometimes we use these areas as shortcuts. So please be mindful of those living in the area because they have priority. Back to you in the studio, Ladon. Thanks a lot, Siaska. Well, joining us live in the studio here on the morning edition is Chief Meteorologist Basil Dean with our weather outlook. Good morning, Basil. Uh, good morning, Ladon. We'll get you started in the tropics, and it is quiet as we like it to be over the Bahamas. High pressure continues to produce uh, moderate to fresh breezes, particularly in the central and southeastern parts of our country. But outside of our studios, we have partly cloudy skies, temperature 81 degrees, and relative humidity 69%. The winds out of the east at 8 miles by your barometric pressure 1019.0 millibars. That's 30.10 inches, and it is steady. Temperatures around the islands this morning, 78 in Green Tulkey, that's Abaco, Freeport, and Grand Bahama. Marsh Harbor Abaco at 78 as well. In the Berry Islands, uh, that should be about 82 degrees, 82 also in Alistair Bimini. Harbor Island at 81, 81 in Rock, San Lutra, Otterstown, Canal at 80, 80 in Stanley Key, also Camp Space, Old Andros, Fresh Creek, and Central Andros at 81 degrees. San Salvador, Room Key, 80 degrees. Uh, we're picking up uh, 81 in Crooked Island, Clarence Town, Long Island, Ragged Island, and Acklands in Machi Town, in Agua, 80 degrees, the Turks and Caicos Islands at 82 degrees. And your boating forecasts are for today uh, in the uh, northwestern islands. Easterly winds at 12 to 18 knots, wave heights 3 to 6 feet. Low tide 941 this morning. High tide will take place in the afternoon at 355. For the central and southeastern islands today, northeast to east winds 15 to 20 knots, wave heights 4 to 6 feet over the ocean. So we're asking small craft in the central and southeastern Bahamas to exercise caution. That's going to do it for your first look at Weather the Morning Edition. Stay tuned. Your forecast for today and tonight is still ahead. Thanks a lot, Basil. Now on to our top story this morning. Education officials are grappling with a second fire at the ministry's warehouse. And this morning, they will assess the future of that location. Minister of Education, the Honorable Jeffrey Lloyd, says based on the items housed in the warehouse, the fire could be reignited. 
So while I was there at 7 o'clock, they did in fact point out that there were two additional hotspots and the fire engine was on the scene just to make sure that the fire is completely out. When I left at approximately 4 o'clock this afternoon, there was still smoke emanating from the building, but the fire seemed to be well under control. I must say, however, I'm grateful to the fire department, grateful to our own staff. Unfortunately, we have lost everything in that building, which included all of our office and textbook supplies, our cleaning supplies. There were some computers that we lost and, and, and some other materials, which has set us back quite a few millions of dollars. Fire investigators are still working to determine the exact cause of the blaze. However, the education minister says the next step for the ministry is finding another location for storage as there are some supplies on order. What really is unfortunate is quite a number of those supplies had just been prepared to be shipped to various family islands who are, as you know, are in need of a regular uh, supply of materials for, you know, cleaning and textbooks and so on. Um, fortunately, some of the materials were on order and they were coming in and we this afternoon were advised by the Ministry of Finance that we could use temporarily a um, warehouse on Gladstone Road, one of the government's warehouse on Gladstone Road. So tomorrow morning our team will go there and survey that particular location to see exactly what it is, exactly what is there, take an inventory of it, supply it to the Ministry of Finance, and then start moving our materials in there. But there's no question that we're going to have to find the money to replace what has been lost because those islands are in desperate need, as well as a continuing supply over the course of the school year. The apprehension of 124 Dominican fishermen and their three vessels took a violent turn after the group opened fire on officers from the World Bahamas Defense Force raising concerns over the safety of officers at sea. And while situations like these are unfortunate, Commander of the World Bahamas Defense Force, Commodore Tellus Bethel, noted how Marines are equipped to deal with these scenarios. The type of work that we do always involves a certain degree of risk. And we always call to put ourselves into harm's way. So it's not only poachers that we have to contend with, but drug smugglers as well, and other persons engaged in illicit activities. But there, there's no real concern with respect to how our personnel are able to respond to these threats. They're trained, they understand the rules of engagement, and they apply certain protocols, which they did during this recent incident. If there is extreme desperation for uh, for example, to, to get wealth through illegal means, then people are inclined to use greater force. And so that will continue. But we, on the other hand, have to be always ready and willing to defend, protect ourselves in the process of apprehending those engaged in those illegal activities. Still, poaching remains a major issue for the country and the government is now looking to amend the Fisheries Act next month that will include stiffer penalties. It's a move Commodore Bethel welcomes. Well, stiffer penalties and fines, sentences always act as a deterrent and it always helps to discourage persons from engaging in illegal activities such as poaching in our waters across the board. And so it would have some positive impact on the level of safety for our persons. The Public Parks and Beaches Authority urging members of the public to work along with the unit to limit visual pollution and unauthorized signs that are being mounted daily. Chairman Shannon Dawn Cartwright says the authority will be re rebuilding its relationship rather with the police to ensure laws are enforced and persons found breaking the laws will be fined. We are encouraging uh, Bahamian public vendors, businesses to follow the regulations. Uh, you come into the authority to get a permit, uh, to have your sign installed, and obviously you are obligated to remove that sign. We're, uh, we are having a challenge with persons who are putting up unauthorized signs. The authority uh, every week and over the course of the weeks to come uh, will engage in exercises to um, take down these unauthorized signs and to be sure that Bahamians are aware that there are regulations in place that governs the installation of signs um, in conjunction with town planning. And still to come in the morning edition, we take you live into the Baines and Grantstown community for a special outreach initiative. That story and more when the morning edition comes right back.
Welcome back to the Morning Edition. Breast Cancer Awareness Month is winding down and it seems the message of early detection is getting out for Bahamian women to conduct not only self-breast examinations, but to also get mammograms and regular breast screenings. Those self-examinations save the life of now 47-year-old Janine LaRota, who was also a native of the Bogey Luthra. Janine has been a breast cancer survivor for eight years and she joins us live in studio to talk about her journey. Good morning, Janine, and welcome to the Morning Edition. Good morning, LaDawn. Janine, you have been a survivor for some eight years now. Take us back eight years ago when you were diagnosed with breast cancer. Well, LaDawn, I remember eight years ago when I was given the news that I had breast cancer. I had no idea that that was going to be the news when I had get, given myself a self-examination one afternoon after doing some aerobics and it was on it was difficult for me to throw my arms and you know what I decided to give myself a self-examination and there I found the breast the lump in my breast and immediately I took action and I went to the, my um, gynecologist at the time and he advised me that I would need to go and have a mammogram done and I did exactly that I don't immediately I just took action I didn't wait I didn't give myself any diagnosis, I just said I need to deal with this and having done all the necessary things that I need to do and having, going to the, um, my doctor, my, my doctor, he um, advised me that, okay, you know, that you would have to have this lump removed and he recommend a doctor to me, Dr. Loxley Monroe, who's an awesome surgeon and I had a, a lump removed and, um, Gave me, he gave me the news that it was cancer and it was devastating because in my, in my family history, there's no one who had been diagnosed that I know of who had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And so it was just something new. And I know in the beginning, I didn't want to tell anyone about my diagnosis at least three to four weeks because I wanted to deal with it internally first. You know, and I'm so happy that I did that because after telling, beginning to tell my family and friends about my diagnosis, it was like that me telling them they had cancer. And I was so happy that I internalized it first. And I remember one um, morning while in the food store and my little angel, Gabriella, my baby was only two years old at the time. And she said to me, mommy, hold my hand. And I said, Gabrielle, I don't need to hold your hand. I said, because um, you're in the trolley. And she said, hold my hand. And she grabbed hold of my hand and she said, don't worry, I'm gonna be with you. I'm gonna hold your hand every day. And I was just so amazed. What is she talking about? And I remember going home and telling my husband that what Gabrielle had said to me. And he said, out of the mouths of babes. And the same thing my pastor, Pastor Vaughn Cash told me that, um, out of the mouth of babes. And you know, going through this, my husband, he has been there, tremendous, he was a tremendous support. My church, they prayed for me every Sunday for the whole year, going through that experience. And there is, I want you to know that there is power in prayer. I want you to know that God is able and there, the, the, the power of the blood, it never changes. I know a lot of survivors do not get the support from their spouses, but you've been fortunate enough to have that experience. Talk to me a little bit about that and how supportive has your husband been through this ordeal? Oh, my husband, he has been with me every step of the way. I remember when I called him and told him what I have found. He said, so what are you going to do about it? And I told him that, okay, I'm going to make that appointment. And I remember when we got the news at the time, he also being a public officer, he was not stationed at in Nassau with me at the time. And I remember giving him the news over the phone and it went silent and I'm like, hello, are you still there? And you know, I guess he just had to just take it in. He has been there every step of the way, every doctor's appointment, every surgery he was there. Remember, I had had uh, my bi uh, bilateral and covering up myself and he said, oh, you don't have to do that and remove the covers, you know, because I felt like he wouldn't be attracted to me anymore. But no, he said, that's okay. You know, he has, I want you to know that I really appreciate his support, just not the support of my husband, but my children, my neighbors, and my, my church, and my colleagues at work. Now you're now in remission. What's your condition like now? Oh, I am just, every day I'm just thankful to be alive. I, uh, I appreciate 
every day when it rains when the sun is out i enjoy it i enjoy being outdoors because i remember there during the time going through cancer i was unable to go outdoors i was unable to go to the bathroom and so it's a pleasure when i go in the bathroom and i look in the mirror and i see my reflection looking back at me i am just so grateful to god when i look at my scars i am just reminded of how faithful he was to me Janine, thank you so much for joining us here on the morning edition Thank you, LaDawn. Meanwhile, residents in the Baines and Grantstown community are benefiting from the Lend a Hand project. The idea is to enhance the lives of residents from a social and economic standpoint. This morning, Siesca Adderley is in the community with more on the initiative. Good morning again, Siesca. Good morning. We're still on Lewis Street this morning, but this time we're joined with Lucas Metropolis. He's chairman of Lendaham Bahamas. Good morning, Lucas. How are you? Good morning. Thanks for having me. Good. Now, what is Lendaham Bahamas? Yeah, so Lendaham Bahamas is a Bahamian nonprofit uh, that was actually founded back in 2014, uh, strictly focused on bringing more opportunities and activities uh, to certain areas around Nassau that could use them. Uh, so, for instance, now we're in Grants Grantstown is where we're starting. Uh, this is a community that's an amazingly historic community that I've been honored to work in and to learn more about. Uh, so right now, a big initiative in the past few years has been to get a headquarters, more of a, a community center set up right here on Lewis Street in Grandstown. It's really a base to begin. Uh, so here we are. All right. And so you were telling me an interesting story off camera as to how you acquired your headquarters and just talk about um, what all is happening to get this headquarters up and running because you have a special event tomorrow, right? Sure. Yeah, I know there's been a lot of support, uh, whether it be through volunteers, monetary support to make this all possible. Um, this building we're actually staying in front of, which is the community center, uh, putting the finishing touches on it tonight, um, and then tomorrow we'll be having an event on uh, right here, a uh, block party, shutting down the street, uh, doing a great event for the kids, face painting, bouncy castle, all of that, uh, 11 to 3 p.m., and then 12 to 12.30 is the actual ceremony portion where you hear from a few people that are really instrumental in this project. Uh, this center, this property was actually donated by a family that is uh, many children, and their parents grew up right here, um, and uh, the Neville, that's why we're actually going to name it the Neville and Nora Dorset Community Center. Uh, it's an amazing family. It's when we were planning this, it was a no brainer to attach their name to it. Uh, one, because of the generous gift of the property to then construct the center, uh, but also just the name and what it means to other members of the community as well. So, so what do you think having a center like this, um, I guess the anchor for a community like this, an inner city community, what do you think having this hair will mean for those in the community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, uh, I was saying to you earlier that um, one of my biggest reasons I've stayed involved, I've supported personally, um, is because I realize so much potential in some of these communities, um, especially among the youth, uh, and just simply lacking the opportunity or the connection to existing opportunities here in the Bahamas as well as abroad. So for this, I'm very excited uh, to bring in obviously amazing groups from abroad to come and run opportunities, but also from throughout Nassau, bringing other charities to join us to offer their amazing programs they're already doing around Nassau, but now with this very unique and a very historic community uh, that I'm excited to work with. Now, I know you have a busy day, Lucas, but just before you go, what can we expect from Lend a Hand Bahamas in the coming months? Uh, so in the coming months, we have a great team. Uh, Sheila Pritchard uh, is handling a lot of our, one of our board members handling a lot of the programming planning with our new executive director, uh, Tammy Clark Ramming and then uh, programs director Mitzi Ann Burroughs. They're sitting down with our volunteers now and crafting out more of the programming they plan to offer. So, for instance, like one focus we, I really want to push, and I know we've talked about, is pushing computer science and computer literacy uh, as well as literacy. But really, what we're trying to do is become a complement to what's already being done in the education system. This isn't a school or anything like that. This is to throw out those extra opportunities linking some of the education they've had. Uh, but also with very unique programs, um, like I said, computer science-based, uh, photography. Uh, there's just so many programs we're looking to run. And we're already building great partnerships with other uh, nonprofits to bring, like I said, bring in their programs. So you'll see a lot of interesting programs coming in this community, but also the focus on working with many kids, but working in small groups to really make sure they understand and they grasp the concept being taught. Not to say we worked with 500 kids in our first month, but to say we work with 40 kids and they really understand the basics of computers.
So you're helping one student at a time, one life at a time. You're going to make a big impact in this community. Well, thank you so much. That was Lucas Metropolis, chairman of Lendahan Bahamas, and they're having a very special event to introduce the community and Bahamas at large to Lendahan Bahamas. So come on down here tomorrow. It's one big party. So come and join. Back to you in the studio, LaDawn. Thanks, Siesca. An organization is making a difference in the community by congratulating persons who carry out good customer service. Crystal Darling reports. Lollipop Love is an organization that rewards individuals who are hardworking in the customer service industry. We met up with them to surprise a very special person. Judith Horton has been an employee at KFC for 36 years, and she says that her customers are her number one at work. One of those customers anonymously reached out to Lollipop Love after receiving excellent customer service from the employee who says she'll always be happy to put a smile on the faces of patrons. My most important thing for me for 36 years is my customers. I wake up in the morning, it's my customer. I come in the afternoon, it's all about my customers. When I see my customers, oh, I bubble up inside my customers. When I can put a smile on their face and I can see them come back over and over, I know I'm doing a good job. Horton also shared one of her innovations with us. This is for the, for the left-hand car because I can't reach them. Some customers can't come out and they said, well, hey, I'm not giving you my money if you can't reach it. So I went to my manager and so I said to them, you have to find me something to help my customers. I first made it out of the box. So when they come, they come and they put it, I put it to them. They say, okay, that's very good. I went to one of my area managers and I said to her, can you get me a stick? I provide the cup. I put the stickers on it and that's me right there. Founder of Lollipop Love, Michael Fountain, says that he believes hard work should be rewarded and explains how his initiative works. We want to increase the level of customer service in the Bahamas. So what we do is we recognize persons that go above and beyond the call of duty in terms of customer service. So if I get a call, you know, says, Mike, hey, I need you to recognize somebody, we interrupt the place of business and <laughs> we reward the person with a, a lollipop and some other gifts. Fountain adds why he came up with the lollipop love idea and why he is passionate about rewarding persons who exhibit good customer service. So I've been in the airline industry for 25 years and our backbone is basically customer service in the industry. You know we're a tourism destination. So customer service is really vital for us to be successful. Um, I had a bad experiences twice within an hour of each, each other one day and I felt I needed to do something. You know, I, there was this saying that says, if you're crazy enough to change the world, you can. So this is my first step in trying to change, well, our community first, and then hopefully, you know, Lollipop Love would be, you know, introduced to the world somehow. Crystal Darling, ZNS Network News. Thanks a lot, Kristen. Uh, Fisher, every Monday and Friday, we've been wearing pink in support of Breast Cancer Awareness Month. I want to say thank you to the Turn It Up Pink team. They gave me a customized uh, shirt for their Turn It Up Pink uh, project this month. I see that you're adorned in your, uh, your well, pink. You know, I'm going all out for you ladies this month. Uh, you know, know a lot of persons that have suffered from this disease. So I went into the back of my closet and I got out the best suit I could have gotten. I saw Basil was all dressed up and I saw you was all dressed up. So you know what I say? I'm not going to let y'all too out do me. So if you think this is fashion this week, wait till next week. I'm going deep, deep in the closet. I may go in the woods next week. So we can't wait. So what's coming up in Coming sports? up in sports, once again, the World Judo Championship starting to wrap up. And then we also have a big basketball game tonight. But it's all about me today, pink. Real men wear pink, supporting the ladies. <laughs> that story and more ahead in sports. Good morning once again and welcome to your TGIF Look at Sports. The World Junior Judo Championships officially open on Thursday. Welcoming the teams was the Minister of Youth, Sports and Culture, the Honorable Nanisha Roll. The Bahamas is becoming increasingly attractive as the ideal Caribbean destination for international sports competitions and athletic relaxation, rejuvenation and recreation. On this, the occasion of the 2018 IJF World Junior Judo Championships, we are delighted to serve as your host country. The Bahamas is delighted to host this year's event, and as we take the words of Bruce Lee, I say to you, go ahead and do your very, very best with simplicity. That was not a good day on the calendars for Team Bahamas, as all five fighters lost, including Devante Sweeting. I held out, but I wasn't 
match, physically match for him, so he beat me. Experience-wise, how do you feel it went for you uh, competing at this level? Um, I mean, this is my first tournament like this, but it's like experience type thing, but I don't feel good about my results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you take from this as a learning experience? Train at all. Take training serious. Now the final setup for Heyman fighters will be in action starting at 10 o'clock this morning. Raven Peniman against Canadian Xi'an Gonen in the 70 kilo division. Then Brianna Major will go up against Melissa Panava from Cuba, also in the 70 kg division. Delano Sweeting versus Tim Smith from Germany in the 90 kilo division. Lyle Sherman against Mohamed Koch from Turkey in the 81 kilo division. And Desmondo Butul against Victor Gonzalez from Argentina in the 81 kilo division. It's do or diddy for the Gladson Road Liquor Panthers in Game 3 of the Bahamas Government Departmental Basketball Association Championship tonight. They trail Olivia's Castle Cyborgs 2 zip. Salatheo D and Fiends, they are playing 5 on 6. The referee, that we need to change the referee, we need to start getting some referee from foreign to call these games. We ain't, no, we ain't no more, we ain't no more clowny referee. We need serious referee with calling these games. We battling hard all week, all month, all year. We put in a plenty of work for this. We ain't put in plenty of work to get cheap at the end of the game, at the end of it. You know, but like I say, is, you know, we still can be competitive. We still can come out and give our best. We ain't gonna never say, okay, we're giving up. We can give a fight every chance. But the next one, when y'all come, it could be a serious one. And that's gonna do it for sports. I have the run out here. Just got a call from GQ Magazine. They wanna do a photo shoot with me. So I'll see you later. In our final look at whether the tropics remain quiet and that high pressure across the Bahamas will continue to support uh, moderate winds across the northwest and central parts of our country right into uh, Saturday, but by Sunday they will be coming down quite nicely. The forecasts are for today, mostly sunny, still breezy and a bit on the hot side. Your high temperature getting up to 87 degrees tonight, just a few clouds and a bit milder, 77 degrees for your low. And the extended weather forecast over the next seven days and in particularly the weekend, beautiful and nice and pleasant weather right through uh, Sunday. And then we'll have some showers come back into the forecast on Monday. Look on. Thanks so much, Basil, and that does it for the morning edition. Thank you so much for waking up with us once again. I'm LaDawn Davis. See you right back here on Monday morning.